Okay, there we go. Hello everyone, how's it going? Team here. Whoops, and that is not what I wanted to do. I hope you're having an awesome weekend. Um, this is BXGS Weekly, episode 32, a JavaScript news podcast, bringing you all the best news of the week. And uh, today we've got, again, not that much stuff. I'm not sure what's up with October and people not publishing enough articles, but uh, we do have some interesting things to discuss. So let's get started, I guess. The first article we got today is called Composable HTTP Client for Node.js and it is essentially a tutorial slash introduction to Request Compose, which is essentially what the title says, a composable HTTP client uh, for Node.js that allows you to essentially compose not just requests, but also compose the properties of those requests, which looks actually very interesting. So if you are unfamiliar with the Compose, um, concept. This is a concept from functional programming that allows you to compose multiple functions into one higher order function, right? Uh, so the idea with uh, request compose is that you can actually compose functions that not just, for example, modify the request headers, but also handle the response, process it, or maybe even execute something in parallel. Like there is, for example, a practical example. Uh, the basic one is using, again, defaults, modifying the headers, and then, you know, uh, sending response to buffer and uh, converting it to string and then parsing it. And a more complex example, <coughs> apologies, <clears throat> more complex example includes the search query that is simultaneously executed towards GitHub, GitLab, and Bitbucket, which is, you know, basically done in just a few lines of code, which is kind of neat. <clears throat> so if you are looking for something like this, do check it out. It looks pretty good. <coughs> God damn it, apologies. <clears throat> okay. So the next thing we got is uh, Tim Berners-Lee Solid and the arrival of the Web 3.0. And finally, Someone uh, named the web 3.0 uh, what it actually is supposed to be, right? So the semantic web and all that kind of things and uh, not actually the blockchain bollocks. Um, so yeah, the article talks about uh, the web 3.0, what it actually is, <clears throat> why do we need web 3.0 and what are the advantages of solid? Uh, I mean, if you've read the article on solid that I've... <clears throat> God damn it, what is wrong? Wait a minute. Let me just, just give me a second. I need to drink something because, <coughs> oh, God damn it. My throat is, um, does not want to act today. <clears throat> okay. Let me just drink a bit of that. <clears throat> All right. I think that's a bit better. <clears throat> okay. So coming back to solid, <laughs> apologies for the, Interruption, um, right, uh, so the solid, right? So if you read the article about solid that I shared, um, I think one or two podcasts ago, then you probably won't really find anything interesting here. So basically just uh, reiterates over it and expands a tiny bit on the concepts in general. But if you have missed it, and if you haven't heard about the solid project from uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, then do check it out. You will get a pretty nice introduction into the concepts and the solid itself. Uh, I highly recommend checking it out because it is a really fascinating project and apparently it's been quite popular. So, you know, I'm quite excited to see how that will develop essentially. Maybe we finally got the um, sort of more widespread use of the semantic web across the everyday or like, you know, common users of internet rather than just the very highly specialized companies have a very narrow um, uh, use cases is what I want to say. Okay. Next article we got is from Mozilla Hacks team. It's called Calls Between JavaScript and WebAssembly Are Finally Fast. And it talks about how exactly the Mozilla team uh, made the calls between JavaScript and WebAssembly fast. Exactly what you would imagine from the title. And uh, the numbers in this article are quite insane. Like, look at this difference. The optimizations are just mind blowing. This is like the only word I can find. And uh, the article is made in the sort of the Mozilla hacks. Uh, I think it's from the Lynn Clark, uh, the, the, her typical style where she does this hand-drawn comics that actually explain you what what exactly is happening in a very simple language. This article is no different. So you got all of these comics that are basically tell you what's happening and 
Uh, you have the Jitland, you have Vasmania and the Interpreter Kingdom, and it's all very cool and very easy to understand, actually. So the article is very worth reading. Um, it's quite big, so I'm not going to go through the whole thing. So if you're interested, there is a lot of technical details and a lot of, uh, like all of them are really well explained. So it's a really cool article and a uh, highly recommended read for this week. <clears throat> okay, next thing we got is the suspense is killing Redux. Um, the article that tries to answer the question, so does suspense kills Redux? And um, the answer is kind of in some cases, I guess, at least for me, you know, from what I've understood from this short example, like we don't really have suspense released yet, but it's coming and we already know how it's going to look and how it's going to work. So the article gives an example of using <clears throat> essentially suspense and suspense components to... Um, fetch the invoice resource in this case, right? It's also using the React cache package that would basically handle the caching on the client side and um, provide the resource immediately, right? Instead of requesting it using the fetch here. It looks very cool. And uh, the fact that, yeah, there's some uh, very interesting implementation details. Like for example, you have to throw the promise which is uh, first time I've read about that. I was like, what? Like, I know, like the thing is that, you know, the, the error is not the only thing you throw can obviously, or yeah. the error is not the only thing you can throw obviously, but I never thought about using throw as a control flow thing, right? So it was always like, hey, so we're gonna break everything here. I mean, it is kind of control flow anyway, but not in that way, basically. So it's a, it's a very interesting pattern and um. I'm pretty curious to see how, you know, how that will work in the reality and if we're going to see more uh, sort of uh, wider application of this pattern uh, throughout the other code bases because it sounds very interesting actually. But yeah, this is sort of a high level comparison of React Suspense with uh, Redux. I guess on a basic level, it will replace it, at least, you know, for very simple things. But um, I, yeah, it's like... If, yeah, so here's the here's a nice quote. However, in my experience, the majority of my clients and people I talk to are using Redux for a little more than a client-side cache or server-side data. If that's you, I think you'll enjoy simplicity and user experience that suspense provides. So that that's a pretty well, you know, formulated summary, and that exactly sums up my understanding of it. So you know, it's not going to replace Redux as the state management, but it can replace it if you are just doing like simple client-side cache. Of server side data because or at least you can probably extract it from redux which will make your code base a lot simpler which is also quite nice all right continuing we got role-based access control and react apps a pretty extensive article on how to implement role-based access control in react applications uh, in this case the article is from the oath zero team so they are obviously using oath zero solution on the back end that basically handles all the access based control and roles and basically whatever you can imagine related to the uh, actually managing the user so it's more of a tutorial on how to do that in client side obviously you can build your own back end and replace it in this tutorial with you know your own thing but um it's like, uh, how do I put it? It's still a tutorial about the client side mostly, right? So because the backend is handled by Althero, so it's kind of nice that you can focus on the client side. But on the other hand, the article does not talk about doing any of the work on the backend. So if you are looking for that, you're not gonna find it here. If you're just looking on how to do that in the clients, well, then this is a pretty good article to get started. And you know, it's also a very good tutorial for Althero as it usually tends to be with their articles. So do check it out if that sounds interesting. <clears throat> okay, next thing we got is creating your first VS Code extension. A tutorial on how to create your first VS Code extension, what it can do, how to publish it. So basically everything you gotta, you have to know about VS Code extensions, how to build them, how to compile them, how to publish them, how they interact with the API, what you can actually do with them, creating a custom views and essentially whatever you have to know about them, ev pretty much everything is here. Uh, worth noting that the official documentation for VS Code extensions is actually quite good. I have built a tiny one myself that is not public because I never, for whatever reason, I don't remember why I didn't publish it, but it was a very stupid thing and it was ridiculously easy to do because they have this like command line generators and command line helper tools like the VSCE. So yeah, if you are looking to create an extension for VS Code, do check it out. It will get you started quite nicely. 
All right, next article we got is writing lighter, faster JavaScript functions. A pretty interesting article on uh, performance optimizations in JavaScript, and I guess generally as well in software development. I found this statement to be quite interesting. There are only three optimizations. Do less, do it less often, and do it faster. The largest gains comes from one, but we spend all our time on three, which is actually quite on point. So <laughs> there's nothing, uh, you know, there's no way to make anything faster if you just do less. It's like, uh, it's a very interesting thing. Uh, we, very, very interesting thought uh, is what I want to say. And uh, it, the article then goes to sh demonstrate that basically in on the example of this function that looks for stooges, right? And the ways that you can actually optimize it uh, using closures, using modules, using property functions, using static property, and so on and so forth. Uh, some additional technical details in here, but uh, in general, you know, I think the, uh, at least for me, the most important bit was this introduction and the quote. Um, the examples are relatively straightforward. So I don't know, there's, um, uh, probably you'll find something interesting here. I mean, it's, it's a curious, at least article, let's put it this way. Okay, next article we got is adaptive serving using JavaScript and network information API. We already talked about the adaptive serving at some point, the article was called a bit differently. The idea is actually pretty uh, straightforward, right? So depending on your uh, network, on the network of the client, you want to serve them different resources. So for example, here's the video. And depending on the, the quality of the network, you either serve a HD video, a high resolution image, low resolution image, or you just show a placeholder if the user is offline, right? It's a really cool pattern. And this is an article from, it's worth noting from Adi Asmani, who's on the Google team and who always writes incredible uh, pieces. So this one is not an exception. And it explains really well on how to use the navigator connection property and how exactly you can work with it, how you can test it using Chrome DevTools and how you can uh, use it to actually serve the um, content that is basically good for your user's network, right? Which can save you a lot of time and, or I guess can save your user a lot of time and make her product more engaging because it will load faster and become um, available earlier, right? So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. It is pretty cool. And I think, um, I feel like we probably need React components that are um, aware of the network. I wonder if that's a thing, network aware. Oh yeah, okay, <laughs> damn it. I was like, yeah, we probably need those components. Oh yeah, they already exist. Okay. Oh no, wait, this is the article that we read last time. So I don't know if this, they, they're actually, published as a package. They're available on code pen, but that's not what I want. Uh, yeah, okay, so they never published them as a package, which is a bit unfortunate, but uh, basically that sounds like a cool project to have. Okay, anyway, continuing, we got tame your Firebase real time database. Bleh. Let's try again. Tame your Firebase. Bleh. I am terrible today. Okay, tame your Firebase real time database with mob x. This is essentially a tutorial for uh, MobX Firebase database uh, plugin or extension, whatever you call it, uh, that guides you through setting up your uh, MobX client side data store, or um, I guess, yeah, I guess you could state management with the MobX Firebase database. God, it's so hard to say that name, MobX Firebase database. Like, who thought that was a good name? <laughs> But okay, yes, how to set it up with your MobX Firebase database um, and how to make all of that work together nicely with um, quite basic React components in this case. It's not extremely complicated, it's just a basic setup, but if you are using Firebase and if you are using MobX and if this sounds like a thing that you would want, this is a pretty good introduction to it. So, you know, we might wanna check it out. All right, next thing we got is Using Winston, a versatile logging library for Node.js. This is a very extensive tutorial on Winston 3.0, which is the latest one, which um, had a lot of changes made to it. So it was like uh, earlier, it was way easier to configure, for example, and needed zero config by default. Right now you do need to provide quite a lot more. Uh, no, I think it wasn't zero before as well, but it was basically simpler because now you have this formats of composable functions, for example. 
And this tutorial walks you through all of that. So it walks you through, you know, the composition of the format, how you can actually make it, you know, colorized and simple or make your own format with timestamps and levels and messages and whatever the hell you want, how you can add files to the logging and so on and so forth. I mean, Winston is incredibly powerful tool and it works with a lot of transports and uh, version three is a bit of a pain in the ass to set up. So if you needed a bit of help with that, do check this article out. It will get you started quite nicely and it will also explain the basic features of Winston, which work quite well. Okay, next article we got is publishing private NPM packages to Nexus. Uh, this is essentially a tutorial for the Nexus repository that is a local NPM registry that you can set up, for example, using Docker in this case. Um, seems to be quite nice. So I never used it myself. Uh, last time I were, I had to use the private registry. It ended up to be, um, I think, what was the name of it? Oh, man. it I think it's already discontinued. NPM registry pri private. Um, Synopia, right. This was the thing, but I, I believe it's no longer developed actually, unless they started doing it again. Three years ago. Yeah. Okay. So this is definitely no longer maintained. Um, at some point, we ended up switching to Artifactory, which is the paid enterprise all-in-one registry that has like NPM, Maven, whatever you can imagine, basically Docker. Uh, but yeah, uh, if you're just looking for the NPM registry, private one, they want to set up locally. Well, this one looks like a pretty nice options. The uh, registry itself is also available on the GitHub. I think it is licensed under Apache too, but please do check it out yourself because I am, I, you know, I didn't spend too much time uh, looking at the license. This Apache was the license that they had in the repo itself. Seems pretty straightforward to, you know, configure and set it up, has like access roles and everything you might imagine, um, supports just about everything you would want from registry. Pretty nice tutorial, do check it out if that sounds like something you wanna do. All right. Next article we got is manual reverse engineering of WebAssembly, static code analysis. Essentially a tutorial on how to uh, decompile the WebAssembly into the, um, what's the name of the, I always forget the human readable format name for WebAssembly. There was a name for it, VAT, right. So how to compile the WebAssembly or decompile WebAssembly to VAT and how to actually read the VAT and uh, there's like line by line look at what those lines do, you know, what happens and how do you actually read that? How do you debug that using Chrome DevTools? So essentially it's a very uh, simple introduction on reverse engineering the WebAssembly and reading the VAT codes uh, to understand what's going on, which is quite nice. So, you know, if that sounds interesting to you, do check it out. Next article we got is what's new in Create React App 2.0 video series. This is a bunch of videos and as well a pretty lengthy article right here that uh, introduces you to all the new features of Create React App 2.0, which is, well, there's a lot of them, right? SAS, CSS modules, SVGs, fragment shorts, uh, Babel macros and all of that stuff. So it came with a lot of goodness and I honestly haven't tried even half of it yet, uh, but I do want to, and this seems to be like a very nice introduction. So if you are interested in knowing more about Create React App 2.0, do check it out. It's This article seems to cover just about everything you might wanna know. All right, next article we got is making a single page app in ye olde JavaScript. And then in quote, it says ES6, which is not exactly ye olde JavaScript, but you know, we're gonna roll with it. Let's just say it's it's vanilla JS is a better way of putting it. So um, just as the title says, the article teaches you how to build a single page application using purely vanilla JS. So you would be setting up the routing, the pages and all of that stuff yourself. The article talks about how exactly that will work, how exactly you can do it yourself. So if you ever wondered how the single page application frameworks work and how do you write your own, well, this is a very good introduction to it. It will also make you understand a couple of things uh, that are sort of typical to the single page app frameworks. So do check it out if that sounds interesting. It's a pretty extensive article and gives you a very good uh, starting point on how to do that uh, kind of stuff. All right. Next article we got is troubleshooting Node.js issues in production with LL Node. If you never heard about LL Node, it's an LLDB extension, I guess. Uh, how do they call them themselves? LLDB plugin for Node.js and V8. 
uh, and it allows you to do a bunch of crazy things with Node.js that would actually be um, very helpful, could be very helpful in debugging stuff in production or you know when something crashes in production. And this article exactly talks about, first of all, why would you need it? Uh, what is post-mortem debugging and why is it useful and how exactly it works and how you can use it to um, uh, tackle the common use cases. So it is more of a sort of, how do I put it? The concept article, right? So it doesn't give you any concrete examples, but it does talks about the concepts and use cases and applications. If you never used LL node, I would recommend learning it. It's a pretty helpful tool, especially for tracking things like uh, memory leaks and uh, figuring out infinite loops. It can be immensely helpful and uh, you know, it's not very hard to use actually. So at least at this stage already, I'm not sure how it was before, um, like a few years ago, basically, right? I tried it like I think last year. It was a pretty smooth experience. So yes, if that sounds interesting, do check it out. It is an amazing tool. All right, next thing we got is common node eight, my mistakes in Lambda functions. So this article talks about Lambda functions, specifically Amazon Web Services Lambda and uh, writing Node.js eight functions for it. Uh, stuff like using callbacks in your synchronous functions when you can just return, not permissifying the core functions, doing things uh, sequentially when you can in reality do it in parallel and do yeah, like, more or less common things that you shouldn't be doing inside your normal code as well, like a sync of eight in for each, which is basically pointless. And yeah, using permissified version of Amazon Web Services SDK. So, you know, if you're writing Amazon Web Services Lambda functions, and if you are not 100% confident in your sync of eight skills, do check it out. There is a couple of good pointers in here. Okay, next article we got is Deaths by a thousand cuts, a checklist for eliminating common React performance issues. It's actually not just a checklist, but sort of a example walkthrough on how you can take an app and improve its performance quite significantly by looking at different things in it, right? So the article, as you can see here, is very extensive, very large, and there's a lot of concepts covered. And it has a very nice GIFs that basically explain what is happening and how exactly you can detect the redraws and how exactly you can tackle that, how you can change your code to, you know, make it better. So if you're interested in optimizing React apps uh, performance, do check it out. There's a very good introduction to it there. I don't think there was any like sort of very in-depth things that are, you know, um, obscure or non-obvious, but if you never did anything like this, it would be a very good starter. Okay, next article we got is taming this in JavaScript with bind operator. Um, so bind operator is this new proposal uh, from TC39 that's been out there for hell knows how long. I think probably more than two years now. I like, I honestly don't remember. I think first time I've seen the bind operator was like, oh boy. Hell, if I remember, when was it? Um, at least a year, basically. Uh, hey, Bako, welcome to the stream. All right, uh, but yeah, so it's here. It's still, oh wait, there's actually the whole proposal. So where's the bind operator? Uh, uh, no, 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 let me mute myself. Bind operate, what, bind? There's no bind operator anymore. Wait a second. Sage three, sage two, sage one. Oh, I guess it's, it's still in the, not even in stage one. That is interesting, spread operator. Do they have a reference to this? But anyway, so the bind operator is a thing. There is a proposal for it somewhere and it's been in stage zero, I guess, for year at least, probably even more. But it is a very interesting uh, proposal. And this article here is essentially a tutorial that walks you through uh, on why do we need it, first of all, and uh, second of all, how do you actually use it? So this is the bind operator. And yeah, this is essentially a tutorial on how to use it in real life. Although, you know, for now, you can only use it when um, using Babel with a additional, yeah, so it's still stage zero, there we go. But yeah, if that sounds interesting, if you are, if you want to keep your hand on a pulse, basically of JavaScript code, then do check it out. It is, it is a interesting proposal and uh, can be quite helpful, but it's still there on stage zero and have not been moving for years. Okay. I've, 
Um, yeah, I've missed missed the mark a bit. Observable, yes, observable is in the proposals. Uh, if you have not heard about that, uh, quite some time ago there was um, oh there was a talk. Basically, the the RxJS team was like, okay, so you know what? Let's just add observables to the core because it makes sense, right? Because right now observables in RxJS and other essentially other libraries that require observation are implemented by on their own, which this kind of does make a lot of sense because observable concept is a very common one and having it integrated into language would make a lot of sense. So they just took a champion, I think it's, uh, who was it like, Jafar Hussein, I think. He, uh, yes, exactly. So he is, I believe, one of the contributors of RxJS, unless I'm mistaken. No, he's actually from Facebook. Yes, he is on RxJS, I think. Um, reactive extensions. Wait a second. Here's his GitHub. Let's just check out. So that I'm sure. Okay, he's definitely doing this observable spec. I believe I saw his name somewhere on RxJS related repo, or at least on Rx repos. Learn Rx. Okay, so yeah, basically he works on Rx a bit, at least a bit. <laughs> so he knows his stuff. So it's re it's really cool to see that actually. And uh, yeah, so it seems like it's going to be moving to stage two quite soon which is quite exciting. Uh, so we're going to see how all of that ends up. All right, let's continue with the articles. So the last article actually I have for today is not actually an article, but a slide deck from the, um, I think it was CEO of NPM. Um, and it's called NPM and the future of JavaScript. And there's a lot of really interesting information here. But uh, oh, COO and co founder of NPM, sorry. So the Slides that I want to show to you guys are essentially slide number five, which is the JavaScript popularity on GitHub. And this is number of pull requests open. So just for those of you who listen, there is 2.3 million pull requests open in JavaScript. And the second place is Python with 1 million requests. So the JavaScript have, oh boy, even more than 100% advantage over the Python, which is kind of insane when you think about it. Learn JavaScript, absolutely. This is like, this is awesome. And uh, if this is not impressive, then there's another slide that is even more impressive. And that was just in like, this is mind blowing. So who is using NPM and JavaScript meaning, right? So if you use NPM, use JavaScript. All 50 of Fortune 50 companies, all 50 of the 50 biggest banks, all 50 of the 50 biggest tech companies and all 500 of Fortune 500. Just think about that for a second. This is like, let it sink. <laughs> if you're still not convinced that you have to learn JavaScript at this stage, I'm not even sure anything else will convince you. <laughs> but uh, do look through these slides. There is a lot more of them and they're very interesting. There's some pretty cool insights in here. Do check it out, it's pretty cool. Uh, now we're getting to the tips, tricks, and small tiny bits of awesomeness. First one here is the, I mean, it's not actually tiny, but uh, no, wait, that's still articles, I think. But basically, okay, whatever. So this is the 13 games that are less than 13 kilobyte of JavaScript. So this is the highlights of the best games that the GitHub guys likes from JS 13K games. So if you somehow missed the JS 13K games that I've covered before, do check this article out. It is cool. It highlights really cool demos and all of them are open source. So you can actually basically see how they were built and why are they so damn tiny. All right, uh, continuing, we got, uh, yes, another tiny thing that is kind of crazy when you think about it. So um, ARM version 8.3 was just released and it adds a new flow to it instruction with errors and out of range values handled the way that JavaScript wants. Meaning that uh, this is the first CPU that was released that was tweaked to make JavaScript faster. As the uh, author of the tweets note here, JavaScript really made it. We now tweak CPUs to make it faster, <laughs> which is kind of mind blowing um, and really awesome to, to see stuff like this. So next generations of uh, mobile phones are gonna be significantly more performant JavaScript wise. And this is kind of exciting. Okay, next thing we got is Edge is finally implementing web components. Custom elements and Shadow DOM are now under development. Firefox is gonna be shipping them to stable soon. So once the Edge is done, we'll finally have the full support in all the, like the uh, modern browsers is what I wanna say, which is kind of exciting. 
finally yes yes indeed finally i mean it took like the I, i'm still amazed that it took longer to implement this than the WebAssembly support <laughs> i guess WebAssembly is considered more important but uh, yeah it's really cool to see that develop all right uh next thing i got here is the bug in node.js uh where the set interval callback function unexpected halt after 25 days so <laughs> Somebody uh, noticed a bug that basically um, stopped executing the callbacks after in set interval after 25 days. There is a pretty large discussion over here. And uh, if you're interested in how exactly it was debugged and how exactly it was fixed and how exactly the problem was found, do check this out because this is absolutely fascinating. Like all the props to author, he actually figured out i think was it the i think it wasn't the author actually it was one of the readers but um yeah it was one of the readers but this is just in like when you think you know this node.js is not just java right because it's this whole complex system of uh, sorry javascript whole complex system of the v8 c++ code and then javascript on top of that and all those bugs they might come from any like any bit of that uh complex mechanism right so when the way that you have to like the the things that you have to do to actually find out a bug that is triggered only after 25 days of runtime <laughs> it's kind of crazy it's also really cool to know that there is actually ways to warp time and make it faster essentially for the specific process which was quite interesting to read about so if that sounds interesting do check the art uh, the ticket out basically there is quite a discussion and it's very interesting to see and read all about that Okay, now we're coming to the releases section. And the first major release uh, is VS Code version 128. And there's already 128.1, which addresses a bunch of minor issues. But this one is quite big. Um, and if you haven't seen it, let me just start it right here and drop it over here. It is really cool. It now looks absolutely black and slick on Windows, at least. Um, absolutely loving the new looks. The other highlights include custom file icons, uh, project level snippets, finally, editor tab completion for people who are, like to use tab to cycle through IntelliSense, uh, jump to last edit, which I'm not even sure if I would ever use. Uh, one of my favorite ones is save without formatting. This was one of the pain points when contributing to a different project that, you know, I always have my prettier turned on on auto formatting. And um, disabling it for a specific project was a bit of a pain in ass. So now you can just use actually save without formatting, which is uh, control K as by default. This is very nice. Like it's a very nice general um, release. Like it's not nothing super uh, exciting. Like, okay, there's the convert to a sync that we already saw as a preview. So it's now actually shipped in a stable and you can just use it, which is always convenient. Uh, but yeah, it's just another very nice release of VS Code. So it's like, really great okay next release we got is downshift version 3.0 that adds aria specification of first and last option highlights and initial star which is basically initial everything props for all states uh, if you never heard about downshift it's a very nice primitive to build um, react components that are basically autocomplete drop down select combo box whatever it's very easy to use and very cool and is developed by um can't see dots primarily and the uh, used in a PayPal website. So it's a very, very good component essentially. Okay, next release we got is node version 10.12, uh, bringing actually the crypto um, module enhancements support for PEM level encryption, which is something that was not there as before and asymmetric key pair generation with a crypto generate key pair and crypto generate key pair sync, which would generate RSA, DSA and EC key pairs, which is really cool because it was not possible before. Um, the other personal highlight is the recursive option for make deer. So you can actually do um, uh, make deer P now, right? So this is what you would run to uh, create the recursive um, folders in command line, but now you can just pass a recursive flag and it will create the whole structure for you, which is finally quite convenient. You no longer have to do it manually or, you know, install third party NPM packages. There is a bunch of other improvements. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. 
We also, this is a reminder, we have a Node 11 coming in just about two weeks. Uh, so quite excited about that as well. Right, next release we got is PeerTube version 1.0. Unfortunately, there's no um, notes aside from bug fixes yet because they're gonna do a, a proper announcement on October 15th. So I'm quite excited about that and I uh, wanna see how all of that ends up. If you never heard about PeerTube, it's um, essentially peer-to-peer BitTorrent-based um, YouTube that is basically using WebTorrent to distribute the videos across people who watch it and the server. Uh, so it's sort of a viable alternative to YouTube without having to own 2 million servers, which is kind of nice. Uh, so I'm curious what the version 1.0 will bring and uh, how exactly the whole thing will develop. And um, next release we got is uh, Things Gateway from Mozilla Hacks version 0.6. I've never heard about this before, but it looks extremely cool. So this is actually Things Gateway, uh, a tool for controlling your home which is built completely using JavaScript. Uh, so you can control stuff like sensors, you can have push notifications, you can press buttons using it. It seems to be pretty complex and integrates with, uh, yeah, seems like quite a lot of things, including HomeKit, including HomeBridge, Philips Hue, Eve Motion, and Eve Door and Window, and there's like a lot of plugins essentially, right? So if you have a smart home, if you have anything related to a smart home, then do check it out. It is completely open source and available on GitHub. There is a link over, there's a download, there's instructions, there we go. There's a link over here. And as you can see here, it's uh, predominantly JavaScript. There's well a bit of Python shell and some HTML and uh, a bit of TypeScript, which is kind of amusing. But yeah, this is, this is really cool and um, uh, kind of, you know, when I see stuff like this, I always get an itch to buy something smart home related to simply just play with it. Okay, next release we got is PWA from Luke Edwards, uh, version 0 0.4, which adds uh, Babel 7 uh, support or upgrades the Babel to version 7. Uh, Preacts that includes a sync loader for easy code splitting and the insecure flag to disable sandboxing on the command line. Uh, so if you have used it, you probably heard about it already. I mean, you probably know about it already if you used it, but if you have never used it, PWA is a universal progressive web app generator that basically allows you to create uh, really nice progressive web apps that basically have everything you want from the scratch and it supports uh, presets, which currently uh, have the Preact, React, Svelte and Vue. And it's, it's a nice little uh, command line tool, basically. Do check it out if that sounds interesting. Okay, um, that's it for the releases. Now we have the demo section. And the first demo we have today is um, NPM Universe Visualizer. So this is all the packages on NPM uh, sorted by size of their dependency, dependence, sorry. And uh, you can fly through them. This is a WebGL visualization and uh, yeah, there's a lot of things. And can you guess what this super large one is? So if you if you was wondering what's the largest thing on NPM is, this is a Lodash. <laughs> no doubts, I think Lodash is one of the most used packages on NPM ever. And you can literally see it from like a all the way out. It's like one of the biggest things. Really cool visualization. I, I think, yeah, the source is on GitHub, so you can actually check it out. You can search for things. Um, just really nice visualization, so thought I would share it. Next demo we have is JavaScript Visualizer. This is super awesome. So it only works for ES5, but it allows you to uh, visualize execution context, hoisting, closure, scopes, and actual code execution uh, right in the browser. So you enter the code, I'm gonna use the simple closure example, and then you can set the speed of execution or you can step through using this button. Just gonna put it on fast and click run. And then we'll actually see how the program runs and how does the execution context looks? How does the current state, you know, variables look and where exactly in the um, execution you are right now, right? So we will see the closures and everything. And this is amazing tool for figuring out how the JavaScript closures work. This is like really, really cool. So if you're still having problems figuring out what are the closures, how they work, and how is your code exactly uh, handled when it's executed, 
try throwing it in here and seeing what's gonna come out and you know how's the um how's the whole uh, process is gonna look because like this is for example if we go over into the function come on go in the function yep there you go you can actually see the execution context and then you know moments later you're actually gonna see the closure scope and it's amazing like this is a really cool uh, learning tool essentially next demo we have is a pico voice embedded private voice ai um oh sorry embeds okay this is you know what this, this is pr speak this is not what we're interested in so this is their main product the private voice ai that you can embed into any product but what's interesting is it's actually based on the voice engine that is available on GitHub and that is built in WebAssembly. So it's a very small voice processing engine built in WebAssembly that you can run directly into your browser. And it's Apache licensed, which is kind of great. So if you want to play with it, you can do it. I don't know if they have a dual license for the um, commercial stuff. Doesn't really. Yes. OK, they do have dual license for commercial. So keep that in mind. But if it's for, you know, research projects or a personal project, uh, do check it out. This seems to be pretty neat and uh, really cool seeing stuff like this, basically. Okay, next thing we got is BotPress, the platform for bots uh, that is a very UI driven, essentially. You can use this UI to build bots. Seems really cool. I mean, I haven't... Um, haven't actually tested it, but it looks really awesome and seems, you know, they're claiming they're powering thousands of bots. Uh, also note there is a dual license, so it's a GPL version three and proprietary license if you want to use it for commercial stuff. But uh, you know, if you're doing a startup you, or if you're doing commercial stuff, then you probably have the money. Anyway, looks pretty neat. So if you, know, if you ever wanted to build your own bot, but didn't want to code too much to check it out, maybe this is exactly what you were looking for because it looks like it has a drag and drop editor essentially, which is <laughs> kind of nice. Okay, next thing we got is Baffle.js, tiny JavaScript library for obfuscating and revealing text in DOM. Um, looks like this, there is a demo here, you can just do this and it's gonna look like this, right? So it's just gonna break things. And if you actually inspect it, it's gonna look broken. This is the cool part, right? And um, the interesting thing is that it's broken in a re reversible manner, so you can actually reveal it which is very interesting. So I have not looked into the source code yet, but this is sort of the gist of the library and um, it's just really cool. So if you, need to, if you need to hide something, including in the DOM, you can actually use that, um, which just looks pretty well made and it just 1.8 kilobyte. I'm really curious on how it works. I'm gonna have to check it out at some point. I guess it's just like bit shifting or something like this, but uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Okay, anyway, the next uh, demo we have is Muse. Uh, this is essentially a rewrite of Chart.js. You've probably heard about them. For some reason, um, their website doesn't really work for me in Chrome. Uh, all the charts are broken. I tried disabling Adblock and everything else. It just doesn't work. But um, let me just close this. If I open Edge, um, it works perfectly fine. So I'm not sure what's going on here. But if you never heard about Charts.js um, or the Charts um, HQ, it's a pretty nice set of uh, charting components that are way easier to use than D3.js. Uh, and there is, I don't know, like creating your first chart. The Muse is even simpler essentially. So they created this uh, data model and sort of have the diffing and VDOM, like VDOM-like algorithm, I guess, that would uh, minimize the refreshes. I like, I don't know why the charts are so screwed up for me in Chrome. <laughs> Still don't understand what is wrong with that. But I maybe some extension is injecting something into the, you know what, whatever. So uh, yeah, it, it looks quite nice. So if you're do if you're working with charts, do check it out. Um, I'm thinking my browser just might be injecting. Is it maybe is it like one of my medium scripts? Are you messing up the thing? No, you're not. Okay. I don't want to dig through my extensions right now, but basically it looks quite nice and, you know, it's very easy to use. So if you want to do charts, do check it out. I believe the license was actually uh, also pretty permissive this time around because before they had like uh, dual licensing with um, 
or I think you had to buy it up straight up. Um, where's the license? License, license, license. Let's have a look at the license. It is actually MIT license, which is really cool. So it is now MIT license. There you go. Okay, next um, demo we have is React Shimmer component, a React image component that simulates a shimmer effect while loading. So it's essentially an image with preload that looks like this. So, you know, the shimmer is like the just shifting color is what I would call it. But yeah, it seems to be straightforward. It's quite nice. I am not sure about this size, but, um, yeah, you know, if you were looking for this, do check it out. Seems to be quite okay. Next thing we got is Node Fetch DOM, a library for Node.js that retrieves a little bit dumb that retrieves the DOM and global virus from remote HTML page. Exactly what you expect. You can uh, fetch the any URL and it will return the window where you can actually get the the whole environment. It is built on top of the what do you call it? Um, nightmare, which essentially runs the whole DOM emulation in your backend. So it's not going to be too fast. But you know, if you need access to the actual page variables, then do check it out. Maybe this is what you were looking for. Okay, next thing we got is Flatbush, a very fast static special index for 2D points and rectangles in JavaScript. Exactly what it says is a special index based uh, set of utilities uh, that allows you to generate a bunch of uh, or add a bunch of index, a bunch of 2D points, and then do things with them like finding neighbors or looking for boundaries and stuff like this. Seems to be very fast. And you know, if you're working with that, do check it out. Um, like spatial indexing is always annoying and having good libraries for it is kind of great. Next thing we got is Colorette, a Node.js library for colorizing text using unsee escape sequences. So this is for command line essentially. Uh, there's a bunch of them, but uh, or a bunch of similar libraries like Chalk and Clur and um, and C colors and whatever. But uh, Colorette claims to be the fastest one out there. As you can see here, it outperforms the fastest libraries quite significantly, which is kind of impressive. And um, yeah, I mean, you know, if you're looking to print the colors and the CLI faster. <laughs> I guess check it out. It looks quite nice. I'm not sure about the size as well. It doesn't mention it, it's just the speed. Okay, next thing we got is high proxy as in HI proxy uh, is a lightweight proxy tool for front end developers based on Node.js that supports Nginx like configuration. So it's exactly what it says. It's a proxy that you can just throw into your Nginx configuration and it will basically work. Uh, it is Node.js based. So I am not sure what kind of advantage this will give you over just using Nginx, um, like maybe monitoring requests, probably like tapping into them. But it's like, I, like, I don't know, I just don't see the use case, at least, you know, from my perspective, but maybe you do see the use case. So do check it out. It seems quite nice. And the fact that it understands the Nginx configuration is also quite cool, because I guess you could use it as a test tool. Um, yeah. So seems pretty nice. Uh, okay, next thing we got is MB, exception free nested nullable attribute accessor. There is a ton of libraries like this, and this is just, you know, one other one. It essentially allows you to access the attributes of an object um, without throwing errors if they don't exist. Uh, once we get the optionals, uh, optional chaining proposal accepted, we won't need libraries like this, but for now this looks quite nice. Next thing we got is Vasm deck. Really, really cool demo. It is a web assembly to C deck compiler. You can throw in a web assembly file and you will get a pseudo C code bag, which basically is way more human readable than uh, web assembly code, right? And uh, it seems to be working really well. This is like really awesome. So you can actually properly um, let me, blah, blah, blah. no, that's not what I want to do. Uh, let me just allow the JavaScript here, come in. So you can now actually properly deobfuscate or uh, reverse engineer the WebAssembly code, which is really awesome. Why are you a git? Yes, please download everything. Yeah, there you go. So this is this is really cool. It's, it's really cool to see so many tools appearing around WebAssembly. Okay, another WebAssembly related thing is Waltz, uh, JavaScript light syntax for WebAssembly text format. So you can actually write um, 
kind of JavaScript-like code, JavaScript-like code is what I want to say, and then compile it to WebAssembly. Uh, it looks like this. You literally have, you know, exports. You have the same returns, ifs, and everything. You do have to provide types in some places, and those are the WebAssembly types. But it's way easier to write this than to write the WebAssembly itself, and it seems like a very nice way to write, um, I guess, you know, the modules that are on a simpler side when you don't want to set up the whole like Rust, for example, pipeline or whatever. And it just looks really cool. Uh, okay, so this is it for demos. Uh, now we are at the silly, interesting, cool section, and uh, we got a bunch of Microsoft news today. First one is Microsoft's open sources uh, parts of the Minecraft. Uh, I believe it was like Minecraft Java edition. So you can actually now go to the GitHub and you can now actually just look at the Minecraft source code. Um, it's kind of, I don't think it's the whole Minecraft yet at least, but at least it's quite significant parts of it, which is, uh, it's like, it, it's quite, quite, quite a surprising move from the Microsoft and something I did not expect them to do, or I would not expect them to do like a couple of years ago, but they seem to be really on a move to become an open source company. And this is just absolutely awesome. So if you were interested in how Minecraft works and if you wanted to play with Minecraft internals and wanted to see the Minecraft source code, um, do check it out. This seems like the history is quite squashed, so you won't really find any super old comments here probably, but anyway, this is fascinating and really interesting. And the next uh, news from Microsoft we got is that Microsoft is pledging uh, quite lots of the patents they have, over 60,000 patents to Linux and open source by joining the OIN which means that uh, they won't be able to use those patents to sue Linux essentially, right? This is kind of great as well. There is a lot of people who are unhappy about that and saying that Microsoft is just want to break everything, which I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, it's on one hand, it's like, I guess you could be a bit scared of Microsoft because they did a lot of bad things in the past, right? Or not very good things, let's put it this way. On the other hand, they just literally pledged majority of their patents. I think they hold like 90,000 patents or something. And they pledged like 60% of that, a bit less or more, no more, a bit more than that, uh, to the Linux and OIN. And how are you not happy about that? But anyway, let's see how that ends up. Um, I think it's a really cool move and I'm quite interested to see what's gonna happen afterwards. Last news we got is not that um, exciting. It's actually uh, published by uh, Brennan Ike, the, um, uh, who is now in charge of Brave Browser, who's like, you know, supposed to be like privacy first and everything. And uh, he's bringing it to our attention that Facebook is going to release a first party cookie app uh, option for ads and pull web analytics from Safari anyway. So if you, if you didn't know, Safari started blocking the third party cookies by default so that, you know, you cannot really get tracked by the using third party cookies anymore, right? So well, Facebook came up with an option of using the first party cookies to track users anyway, uh, which, which is a bit of a dick move. And apparently Google is also doing the same. So uh, it looks like blocking third party cookies by default won't be enough soon and you would have to block the first party cookies by default and then allow them when needed, which uh, is a bit disappointing, but not that, you know, that unexpected basically. Okay, that's actually it from my side. That's all the news and articles I have for today. If you guys have any questions or maybe I missed something or maybe you wanna share your own projects and do throw them into the chat right now. If not, then we can just wrap this up here and uh, go uh, do something else. And, uh, you know, have an awesome rest of the weekend and stuff. I'm gonna give you a couple of seconds as usual. Uh, you can find all the links on the GitHub and you can join our Discord server if you wanna discuss any of that or you need help. Uh, and uh, yes, I'll be more than happy to cover your personal projects if you have any, and if not, then uh, yeah. 
Okay, uh, seems like there is no uh, questions and suggestions. So thank you very much, guys, for watching. Thank you for your support. Have an awesome weekend or the rest of the week. And I see you next time. Bye.